I'd like to spend the next few minutes talking about aesthetic reconstruction in thyroid eye disease. It's an important topic and I think many patients are at their wits end often thinking about all the facial transformations that undergo with thyroid eye disease. First of all, what have we learned about thyroid eye disease? Well, we know that it's an autoimmune disorder. We don't know exactly what causes it, but we do know that autoimmune cells invade the, both the thyroid and the orbit and they cause tremendous amount of scarring and inflammation. And we often wait until that most of that disease subsides before doing surgical correction. This disease is extraordinarily heterogeneous and it affects many people in many different ways. Some people it can cause a blinding condition and it can cause tremendous amount of eye bulging. And other people it causes very little changes but they, they can be very, very bothersome and they can be very life altering. In fact, many studies have shown that the that what Graves' disease and thyroid eye disease can do, and the, that disease in general, is just as detrimental to the quality of life as having breast cancer or being diagnosed with a chronic disease. So don't underestimate the impact of this disease upon your life. Our goal is to return or to improve upon your pre-disease appearance and function. Many people feel a little anxious about thinking about the aesthetics, but this disease affects women and men, usually more women than men, in the midlife and in the prime stages of life. And it can cause extraordinarily problems including dryness and pain and irritation and double vision. And then it also has the double whammy of causing your appearance to change. And no one wants their appearance to change and our goal is to turn back the clock and to erase some of the effects of this disease and hopefully to even to improve the appearance in many cases. Some people also often feel a little guilty about thinking of just the cosmetics of this or the aesthetics of this disease. And I always think that if you were in an auto accident and you had a severe injury and a cut down your face or a bone you know, break in your cheek, would you think twice about having this fixed? No. That's, that's the same type of, you know, alteration that's going on due to this disease. The eyes are bulging, there's a transformation that's going on. And we're not looking to do cosmetic surgery, we're looking to do aesthetic functional surgery, improving the appearance but also improving the function. These are some examples of patients who have undergone this went this disease and the transformation that it can cause. And for each of these, they had to face their own trials and tribulations. But fortunately, as you'll see, these patients, we were able to turn back the effects of this disease and really improve things, both form and function, and the quality of their lives. A critical concept in building the foundation for the reconstruction of this disease is that the eye prominence or the degree of eye prominence really dictates often how severe this disease is because it dictates how the lower eyelid looks, how the mid face can look, how the brow can look. And the more prominent the eye, the more you're going to have to suffer with the consequences of some aspects of this disease. For example, the more that you squint with the brow, the more that you try to elevate and you know the lower eyelids, and this the harder it can be. So the erasing and improving the eye prominence is really a central feature and can make all those other features of the disease much better at the same time. There are camouflage techniques such as trying to lift up the eyelid and mid face, but if you try these while the eye is still prominent or without correcting at least some of the eye prominence, it can be a very difficult problem. Take for example a man with a rather rotund or beer belly. If you just try to tighten his pants or try to push up these pants, um, but especially by tightening the belt or doing small procedures, what you're left with is just an eyelid or a belt in this case that comes underneath that globe and it even makes things look worse. So camouflage procedures have to be taken very cautiously. One of the things that we have done is shown that by reducing eye prominence, you can actually elevate the lower eyelid in a very predictable way. This often means that we don't have to do further surgery to the lower eyelid to get rid of the white under the eyes or the scleral show. Discuss this a lot in another lecture, but in essence, what we've been able to do is by moving the eye back and moving the eye down a little bit with a standard but a customized decompression, we can eliminate most 
or if not all, lower eyelid surgery necessary. In fact, I've eliminated about 90 to 95% of the lower eyelid surgery from my practice and rarely do it except in really severe cases by reducing the eye prominence and doing a very customized, focused decompression. So many ask, why a customized approach? Well, I think it's very obvious that we can move the eye in any direction and we can improve many of the soft tissue signs and features of this disease. But the fact is that there are very different features. And as you can see in this slide, the disease affects people in very different ways. So taking a homogenous or one-size-fits-all approach would, is, in my mind, crazy. Instead, we customize it to the unique expectations and goals of each patient. And the goals are very important. Listening to you and finding out what goals you want out of this surgery is probably the number one aspect and the number one thing that we think about as we're in our surgical planning process. There are non-surgical interventions. For example, building up the cheek a little bit with fillers or even fat can dramatically improve that foundation and that platform and reduce the relative prominence of the eye. And these are often used in conjunction or alone. And so for mild disease, there are even non-surgical options that can offer a very nice improvement. What I'll deal with through the rest of this discussion is the customized approach to the decompression and how we stepwise think about this in a very complex but a very logical algorithm. So there are several key factors to surgical planning. First is a patient's goals. What your goals are with the surgery is the most important thing. You can tell me I want to go big or go home or you just want a subtle or a stepwise improvement and that is the first step in the surgical planning. The next is what type of disease you have, whether you have a fat predominant or a muscle predominant disease. This very much changes in the type of whether we're going to remove fat, remove bone, and what kind of risk we're taking with either of those procedures, and we'll talk more about that. Third is disease severity. The more severe the disease, the more difficult it is to treat. If you already have double vision, we can take certain privileges or we might have to prepare for that surgery to fix the double vision. Often strabismus surgery to fix double vision allows the eye to come forward. So we always want to take that into account and to think about that long before we're met with the consequences of that outcome. Finally, we want to think about the bony structure. If you have a very small bony cheek, it's very important that we reduce the eye prominence because overcoming that bony structure can be very difficult. And then finally, the soft tissue structure. What do the brows, the eyelids, and the mid-face look like? This disease can often affect each of those areas, especially the fat in those areas, changing the shape of the face. And in many people, we want to alter those contours in a very specific way, and that we think of from the very beginning. This whole process is like building a house, and decompression is the foundation from which we build upon. One thing that's very important is the type of disease. Fat predominant disease, as shown here in the CT scan, shows very thin white muscles with a predominant of black in behind the eyes. This often is met in patients, seen in patients that have a very high degree of eye bulging, but they move their eyes quite well. This surgery on these particular patients typically has a low chance of double vision and goes very well, but we have to really reduce the amount of prominence. Muscle prominent disease, on the other hand, these patients often don't have a lot of eye bulging. In fact, they may have more redness and just more angry appearance, but without a lot of eye bulging. It appears more often in patients who smoke, and there's a much higher chance of double vision and a much higher chance of vision loss. So how do we approach the disease? I think of it as sequentially in approaching it first with the decompression and then other forms of surgery to help to improve. But we want to try to accomplish as much as possible. And we've been able to, by doing focused decompression and customized decompression, eliminate the need for often for multiple surgeries. We can often do in one or two surgeries what was previously done in four or five surgeries. But we do think of this as a sequence. In, de in decompression, think of first removing fat behind the orbit and then the lateral wall. This poses the least amount of risk. Then as we go on, the second and third wall becomes the medial and then the orbital floor. All these have an increased risk primarily of double vision. 
There's very little and relatively low risk for any vision-threatening complications, but double vision poses the biggest risk, and each of these incremental steps gives you more and more risk of double vision. Thus, the algorithm for decompression surgery tends to be complicated. I'm not going to bore everyone with it, but it's a lot that goes into thinking about this and customizing it on a basis. First of all is disease severity. And the more the mild, moderate, you have lots of options, especially if you have a fat predominant disease where we can do various things and different types of decompression. The more severe the disease, the more di interventions we will need to take. But there are, as I mentioned before, there are lots of other considerations too, such as soft tissue considerations. And this is very important, especially if there's lower eyelid retraction, where we may want to remove different parts of the bone, such as the basin, and that can dramatically reduce the number of surgeries that you need, especially lower eyelid surgeries. And these are all very important to achieving the final aesthetic result that we want. The first step often is a fat decompression, and I remove fat in almost all decompressions that I do. This is a very safe procedure done alone or in combination, and done alone, it can be done under monitored anesthesia and has less than a 1% risk of double vision. It can be very effective in the right circumstances, and we use a very specialized suction technique that really minimizes the risk and allow patients to go home that same day. The disadvantages are that there may or may not be a lot of fat, and the first thing we want to do is assess how much fat is available, and then how much bleeding and such may be prone, this fat may be prone to. So the first step is to, if you have fat predominant disease, we may be able to achieve a rather large improvement with minimal risk. This patient wanted to achieve a relatively modest decompression of about three or four millimeters, and was done mostly through a fat decompression, just allowing the globes to appear less prominent, reducing the white under the eyes, and giving a much softer appearance during this disease process. The next step I often take is to do a lateral decompression if it's needed. This not only can remove and reduce the amount of axial proptosis or the amount the eye sticks out, it can move the eye in any direction, including down, again, reducing lower eyelid retraction and the white under the eye. This is often done through a very hidden incision, either in the eyelid crease or no incision at all through the inside of the eyelid. And then areas of bone are drilled or sculpted down to make room for the expanded tissue, including the muscle and the fat that's secondary to the disease process. I won't get into the specific details of what's done during a lateral decompression, but it has a relatively low risk of double vision, anywhere from 5 to 15 to 20 percent, depending upon the type of disease that one has. And it can often be done in about an hour and is an outpatient surgery. I often do both sides at the same time in patients who can tolerate this procedure. And surprisingly, there's minimal pain. Most of the bruising and swelling, 80%, is gone within two weeks after the surgery. And patients tolerate this quite well. Even though it may sound less than appealing, patients do very well from this type of surgery. I'll next show a few patients who've achieved, I think, very good results with this type of decompression. And these patients have had eyelid surgery, so they've just had the decompression, which really gives you an idea of how much you can achieve with this form of surgery. This patient had a fat and lateral decompression with six millimeters reduction in proptosis, which also reduced her pain, pressure, tremendously and made it much easier to work and to take care of her children. This patient also had a very substantial reduction. We wanted to reduce her three to four millimeters so that she had a normal appearance to her eyes. It's very important to reduce patients to the amount that they were preoperatively or pre-morbidly such that we can achieve a precise result. We don't want to over decompress or under decompress and so old photos are critical in this process. There are often special considerations and the lateral wall can be divided into many parts. So I will sometimes remove or sculpt various parts of the lateral wall depending upon what we're trying to achieve. For example, in this patient she had very severe disease and we wanted to achieve a substantial reduction and also allow the superior brow and the lacrimal gland to again hide behind the orbital rim where it's supposed to be. And she achieved a six millimeter reduction in proptosis and required no additional surgery and did not have any double vision. This patient also achieved a very substantial reduction in her proptosis and she had a 
fat and lateral and superior decompression, meaning, superior meaning the superior part of the lateral orbit, with a six millimeter reduction in proptosis. Her story actually appears elsewhere in YouTube discussing how this disease affected her life. Patients of different ethnicities can present unique problems. For example, in many patients, I don't like to make an eyelid crease incision. You can see it in some patients, or it could cause keloid or darkening of the skin in those areas. So for patients who have pigmented skin, Asian patients, Middle Eastern patients, I tend not to make an upper eyelid crease incision unless I feel it can be completely hidden. So for this Asian patient, you can see that she had dramatic effects of this disease with eye prominence. Without a skin incision, just through the corner of the eyelid, we were able to make and, re and reduce the amount of proptosis that she had back to a near normal position for her. On side profile view, you can also see that she had a dramatic reduction in the amount of eye bulging and now has a normal eyelid to cheek junction and a normal appearance. For patients that even need more decompression than what can be offered bilateral or that have a congestive form of this disease, I will often do a medial approach. And this is not through the skin, but it's through the inside of the eyelid in a very hidden manner, and it allows us either to push in some or all of the sinuses. And again, this is done in a graded approach. It is a very effective solution for reducing very severe or moderately severe proptosis or congestion, but it does have some disadvantages, including a higher rate of double vision, which can be as high as 20 to 30 percent in some patients. Despite these disadvantages, you can certainly see that in many patients it offers a wonderful solution to a problem. This particular patient had become isolated and did not want to go outdoors and had given up many of the things she enjoyed. However, after the surgery, she was able to resume her active lifestyle and ended up completing a triathlon shortly thereafter. This is another patient who achieved a dramatic proptosis reduction and we also dropped or lowered the globe to improve the lower eyelid position. She did not have any additional lower eyelid surgery or any other surgery at all and we achieved a seven millimeter reduction in her proptosis. This is a woman who also required dramatic proptosis reduction, nine millimeters and we did a maximal decompression of the lateral bone, but also did a medial decompression. And since she had relatively fat predominant disease, she did not require any dilid or strabismus surgery and had a very good improvement with just this single series of surgeries. So what do we do when everything else fails, when someone has had multiple operations or has very severe disease? Well, this is a case where we've done decompression, but it's still a substantial lower eyelid retraction. And in these cases, I will often place an implant to build up the cheek and to reduce the relative prominence. This mid-face augmentation using a silicone or a Gore-Tex implant then allows the cheek to support the lower eyelid and dramatically reduces the lower eyelid retraction. And from profile, it goes from showing a negative vector or very eye prominent case to one where the cheek can support the eye and support the lower eyelid. In cases where there's been a lot of surgery and we're not sure what to do, often decompression is the first step in regaining the appearance and improvement of the situation. In this example, this woman had undergone many surgeries, including previous decompressions, but was at a loss and was having difficulty with the vision. The first step that we took was to improve things by doing decompression and then soft tissue contour remodeling that allowed her to achieve a very dramatic improvement in her appearance and in her function. Hopefully I've shown and given you examples and explained how customized aesthetic orbital reconstruction can dramatically benefit patients with thyroid eye disease. I think that if this is in line with a patient's goals and in a customized way, there can be dramatic achievements and improvements made.